And when you start to think and act from that expanded level of global comprehension and global EEG coherence, thoughts are lucid, powerful, and they're just no obstacles to the accomplishment of your goals. That's enlightenment, but it's more than that. Enlightenment is more than being super efficient, super clear. It is that. But enlightenment is knowing our core, universal, blissful self beyond space, beyond time, our immortal self. That's science today. Science recognizes that you, me, everything is ultimately the unified field. Humans are lucky. We can experience and know that timeless cosmic aspect of ourself. Enlightenment is when that fleeting experience of meditation becomes permanent so that dynamically engaged in action or even deeply asleep, you're never ever lost to the infinite, unbounded, blissful nature of your immortal, universal self. That's the joy. That's why it's called liberation, because we enjoy our action to the fullest, but nothing can ever crush us. We're sort of invincible within. Because no matter what happens on the outside, whether it's anesthesia or even physical death, we've established ourselves in who we really are. Unbounded universal consciousness. The origin of the universe is our own big self. That's enlightenment, living that. Living the truth of the unity of life. Experiencing everything for what it is, the unified field and a wave of universal existence, which means a wave of my own cosmic self. So unity is everything. Everyone, everything is lived in the wholeness of oneself. That's bliss. Everything's a wave of bliss. We've had quite a few people on Conscious TV recently talking more about the ordinary awakening and how enlightenment is much more attainable now than it used to be. It, it used is. to be people having to sit in caves for 30 years and very, very dedicated and a complete total practice yes. and isolation from the world. But it seems now something's speeding up. It is. And it's more available to us all, in effect. It is more available. It's an interesting phenomenon. Um, and there are reasons for it. Well, for one thing, of course, we're living in a scientific age, which has a good, a good side effect. Um, in, with science, we can actually discriminate between different techniques and discover which ones really work most effectively. Which ones are developing this global EEG coherence? Which ones are giving that absolute state of rest and infinite expansion? So we know that this works well, this works eh, less well. So people are actually flocking to things that are working and therefore they're evolving more quickly. Another thing though, and this is pretty abstract, when an individual expands to become, well, basically cosmic in meditation. It stimulates that unbounded reality. The field of consciousness, which is at the basis of all of us, is becoming as if enlivened. So today, and I've taught meditation for years in, in prisons and schools and for the homeless and everywhere, the executives, whereas it used to take a long time of deep, deep diving to discover that inner self, the unboundedness, now it's almost right beneath the surface. Close the eyes, boom, you're gone. So somehow that abstract field of consciousness is more concrete today. Is this because more people are meditating? It's yes, it is. And in groups. It's an interesting phenomenon, but group meditation by, say, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 people, 8,000 people, uh, particularly with you know, powerful techniques of meditation, enliven very powerfully the field of consciousness so that everybody enjoys the benefits. So you can measure, for example, the brainwave coherence in non-meditators in the geographic vicinity of meditating groups. And you'll see that they wake up in the morning with more EEG coherence, with lower plasma cortisol, stress hormone, with higher serotonin. This is a published, statistically significant result. So there is a field effect of consciousness. There's a group dynamics of consciousness, group effect of meditation, a spillover effect into society that you can measure physiologically, you can measure it in terms of reduced crime, social violence, even reduced war. It's an incredible thing to talk about, but today we have the scientific method, we have publication in peer-reviewed scientific journals to show that group meditation works to enliven the field of unity, field of consciousness, field of peace in everyone. 
you mentioned that, in, I think you mentioned schools and you mentioned prisons about meditation. I was quite intrigued, again, we were talking earlier about the prison programme, and I also mentioned to you that um, I met Bo Lossoff once and read, and his book, We're All Doing Time, is one of the most touching books I've ever read, of, and he basically helps to teach meditation and yoga in prisons, and the effect it's had on, from what I read, prisons is, 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 is extraordinary, in fact. And I think you also have a programme, don't you, of going into prisons and, and teaching meditation to prisoners. Very much so. In some cases, in entire countries, where it has been adopted voluntarily, but with huge response in the prison system. Why would a government do such a thing? It sounds so radical. Well, basically, I, I suppose, driven by desperation, because what's being taught in prisons today, rehabilitation programs aren't working. People who leave the prisons find their way back. So whatever's going on in the prisons today ain't rehabilitation. Some people might say it's uh, getting a PhD in crime to go to prison today. Introduce meditation spreads like wildfire. It gives relief in those pressure cookers of stress. Most importantly, though, bottom line is people don't go back to prison. The brain is developed, as we've talked about, functional holes in the brain, parts of the brain, particularly up here in the higher brain, shut down under stress, fail to develop properly, and that results in criminal behavior. It's hardwired in us, but the meditative experience engages the total brain, including the higher brain, integrates the higher brain with the rest of the brain, and that re restoration of the higher brain results in comprehensive thinking, the ability to consider the implications of our action. And that basic, that brain development brings rehabilitation in a degree that has not been achieved before. So you can take a brain that is severely imbalanced, filled with what are called functional holes, and in six to nine months, regular TM practice, those holes are gone. The whole brain, total brain function, balanced brain functioning gets restored, and the result of balanced brain functioning is balanced thinking, balanced decision making, and people don't commit the crimes that harm society. So explain the holes a bit more. Yeah. Well, holes, we call them f holes in the brain, but they're just functional holes parts of the brain that aren't firing, where the neurons are not actively participating. Those so, holes... So they've kind of gone to sleep or passive or underutilized, dormant. dormant even, yeah. you yeah. could say, atrophy. And, and, and why would that happen in the first place? Well, it happens in the higher brain, which is all important. This is the CEO of the brain. This is our rational filter against primitive, aggressive, impulsive, violent behavior. When the higher brain shuts down, all of our higher human functions, moral reasoning, judgment, planning, shut down. Now, under stress, the higher brain shuts down. The so primitive brain takes so over. So the prisoners have been through a stressful situation, yes. which, of course, many of them have family Chronic situations. Stress. Yeah. It shuts down, yes. and they're unable to act in a rational, civilized yes. society yes. way. Yes, yes. And unfortunately, okay. that sort of... Um, metabolic dysfunction, those functional holes are becoming more and more the norm. Mm. Because the stress of life, pace of life is more, the inner city schools, pressure cookers of stress. Whole parts of the world, North Korea, the Middle East, and the Pakistani border, constant pressure cooker of stress. If uh. you look in those communities, or the prison community, functional holes in the frontal cortex, ubiquitous everywhere. So because of that, crime runs rampant violence in the Middle East, what can you do about it? I, the ration will not prevail because the rational mind is gone. So what you need to do is restore the rational mind. The meditation engages the total brain. It restores blood flow to the entire brain. And when the brain's working properly, prisoners, for example, will say, that was a terrible thing I did. But surely, John, not all prisoners are going to go along with this. I understand some do, and I can also understand you get great results, but there must be some that are completely resistant. There will be some, but surprisingly few. I'd say the resistance is not from the prisoners. I'd say the resistance is probably from the state and federal governments who are not ready to fund a program like this. There are a lot of people who say, no, 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 they don't need meditation, they need punishment. But, but, no, I understand <laughs> what people say, yeah. And the problem yeah. with the punishment is maybe, maybe somebody gets satisfaction from meeting out punishment but it doesn't rehabilitate. The proof, you know, proof is there. All right, make them do their time, but if at the same time you can 
reintegrate the brain, restore balanced brain functioning, 